My name is Alicia Wright. I'm going to be you guys' host for this next segment. And we're so excited that you guys have been joining in. Super excited. Um, yeah, and we just thank you for coming. So this next portion, um, just even as I begin, I just want to share a little bit about myself. So I'm actually um, one of the, well, the education advisors here with FinMango. And so one of the things that I've been able to do over the course of the last year is really just go into the school system um, in India and be able to teach people that um, are interested in learning about financial literacy. And so today, though, we're going to switch over to Africa right now. Um, and we have someone who's by the name of Max Sarva, and he um, is going to be our keynote panelist today. So. Max Sarba is a multidisciplinary scholar, thinker, and innovator. He's passionate about applying leadership, education, and innovation to making social impact in developing countries. He's the founder of Ed Acme and the Sarba Foundation, social enterprises to help reduce access, quality, and relevance gaps in education. So Mac holds actually a master's in philosophy from the University of Cambridge an MA from Columbia University, and a Master of Design in Risk Resilience from Harvard University. So thank you so much, Mac, for coming today. We're so excited to have you. Thank you for jumping on. Uh, thank you, Alicia. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, good, after, uh, good morning if you're in the United States of America. Good afternoon if you're in Sub-Saharan Africa, and good day to you. Uh, everywhere else in the world. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the unique opportunity to be uh, able to share my insights with you. Um, let me take a moment to express my heartfelt thanks to Scott Glasgow and the team at FinMango for working so hard to put this extravaganza together. I also want to thank all of you uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for this great event. I'm really, really happy to meet all of you although virtually. Before I proceed, let me take a moment to recognize the uncertain times that all of us are facing, a time that has shaken the very foundations of the world, a time that has brought the world to a halt and jolted us into unprecedented isolation and pushed us to rethink what it means to be human. But I'd like to assure all of you, wherever you are, that together we will get through this. We will overcome and bounce back stronger, more resilient, and more purposeful. I'm really, really excited to, to, to share with you on the role of financial inclusion in harnessing entrepreneurship potential and its impact on economic development. Uh, but before I do that, let me take you along a journey. Uh, uh, let me share with you a story. On May the 30th, 2019, exactly a year ago, I joined a long line of students who were proceeding from the fourth floor of the building. There were about 90 students in my cohort. They were wearing gowns and caps. I was the only black person amongst them. I was the only African among them. One by one, each of them walked toward a man who was giving out presents in big white envelopes. I missed cheers from friends and family. Each of them made giant steps toward what would be monumental accomplishments in their lives. Then came my turn. I stood there, numbed by the magnificence of the occasion, by the beauty of the occasion and by the grandness of the occasion. Then I heard my name, McLean Saraba. With mixed feelings, I took majestic steps, shook the person who was dishing out the present and collected this big white envelope. I heard my family and friends and well-wishers cheer as I made my way to my seat. I heard my three-year-old niece cheer, the best uncle ever. Wow, I had graduated from Harvard University. 
Imagine me at a similar procession a few years ago at Columbia University in 2012, at the University of Cambridge in England in 2013. What a miracle. Why do I say this was a miracle? Well, I grew up in a small town in the Bono East district of Ghana. There was no electricity. There was no running water. Every morning, I would walk several miles to fetch water from the Volta Lake. Water for cooking, water for bathing, water for washing laundry with our bare hands. I did my first 12 years after junior high school in this community. Though there was no electricity, I enjoyed reading and studying with kerosene lanterns. Sometimes the smoke from the burning kerosene would make my eyes red and teary. I never gave up. I dreamed and hoped and prayed that someday the God that we danced to in church on Sundays, the God that we prayed to in the mornings, the God that our grandparents told us was a compassionate God will lift me from that place to a place where people used toothbrushes and ate with forks and knives and drank cold water from a machine and watched the screen of a machine with human beings in it, making different kinds of movements and sounds. Now, let me bring you to financial inclusion within the context of my community. In the community in which I grew up, most of the people were fishermen and farmers and petty traders. In those days, there was one small bank in the community. When I was young, I thought the bank was built for, 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 for the few government workers. These were the elite in the community. They were teachers and nurses and sanitation officers. For the majority of the people, the bank was in their bedrooms. Sometimes they would put their hard earned money under their pillows and burglars would come in and thieves would come in. And in just one night, all their hard work would be gone. They would wail and cry and curse their stars. They would be unable to feed their children, unable to, unable to let their children go to school unable to let their children go to the hospital. Well, what, what actually looked like a hospital. Honestly, when I was growing up in Yeji, life seemed to be going quite well for me and my family. My dad was a carpenter. He made canoes and fishing boats from massive wood. He often traveled to a city called Kumasi, uh, about four hours, four hours south of Yeji to buy wood for his work. He was doing quite well. Back in those days, I would often see him counting money at the end of the day. There were no stocks or treasure bills or life insurance of or mutual funds. My dad was a very smart man. He was always worried about the future, about making sure that his eight children went to school. He was a planner. So, to ensure his own life and that of his children, he invested in what was then the major investment in the community, a ranch of cattle. He hired nomadic herdsmen to look after his cattle and built a ranch and a place for them to sleep in a very far away village. The only way you could reach this village was a long bicycle ride for many hours and many miles. I would often see my dad make this long journey to visit his investments every so often. As an elementary school kid, I often took account of wood that was spent every week or even the number of cattle. I would often sometimes join him on these long journeys or any of his apprentices on these journeys. My back and buttocks would hurt from sitting on hard metal for so many miles and so many hours. You know, God actually blessed my dad. His cattle increased and increased and increased. 
Then, at about 49 years old, he returned from work one day and collapsed. He was completely unconscious. Some good Samaritans rushed in and took him to the clinic, or what looked like a clinic. The doctor, or what, what looked like a doctor, said my dad had suffered a stroke. He was paralyzed. And that was the beginning of hell for him, for his family, and for his investments. You know, my dad was a very proud African man. He did not want to show weakness. He was a fighter. He fought for freedom from stroke. In this fight against this disease, him and my stepmother traveled across Ghana, from pastors to medicine men, from doctors to traditional herbalists. He was desperate to be healed. So we were left by ourselves, unsure of when our parents would return, unsure what the future held. At the time, I was just about finishing junior high school. There was no one to supervise my dad's work and none of us was old enough to understand the business of canoe making and cattle ranching. So things went completely wrong. The business collapsed. To make things even worse, a cattle disease called anthrax arrived and killed many of my father's cattle. My dad's main investment was gone in the blink of an eye. The future of his family was now in complete danger. So my childhood dream of going to a good high school when I graduated junior high school was completely over. Now, at the time in Ghana, high schools weren't free. So you had to be able to pay if you wanted to go to a good one. And that was how I ended up at a high school where you had to walk several miles, where there weren't enough teachers and classrooms and where classrooms were so dark that you had to strain your eyes to be able to read. And that is why when I was one of the very few to come out of that high school to the University of Ghana, which is my first time in the city, and then to Columbia University in the city of New York, and then to the University of Cambridge, and then to Harvard University, I called it a miracle. So now, the question some of you would ask is, okay, Max Arba, so you have all these degrees, now what? How will your community benefit? How will your country benefit? How will your continent benefit? It was the poet Khalil Gibran who once said, and all urge is blind, save when there is knowledge. And all knowledge is vain, save when there is work. And all work is empty, save when there is love. When you work, you bind yourself to yourself and to one another and to God. And this is what brings me to the Saba Foundation. You know, I asked God to help me understand the purpose of my journey and of the struggle and of the setbacks and of the challenges. I did a thorough introspection. I prayed, I meditated. And then it came to me that my purpose on this planet the reason for all that struggle is for me to be able to help people, especially young people, realize their potentials, achieve their purpose, be the best they can be. And that is what led me to wanting to help young entrepreneurs in Ghana and the African continent. What led me to wanting to help young people get the education they need? What led me to youth unemployment? When I graduated from Harvard last year, I got on a very, very, very massive jet. Had a layover in Dubai for 12 hours and arrived in Accra, Ghana. 
I went to Ghana to understand the issue of youth unemployment. I wanted to understand how we can use entrepreneurship to help young people get the mentorship and funding and support they need to create their own jobs. I talked with many struggling entrepreneurs and unemployed university graduates and employers and university administrators to understand the problem. Many of these young graduates were worried about the future, about their families, about where food would come from. I realized that it is, it is not that young people do not have ideas. The problem is that many of them do not have financial support and mentorship and guidance. And that is why I set up the Saba Foundation with which we wanna be able to help young people, not only in education, but also entrepreneurship, fine tune their ideas, get the mentorship, the support and the financial support they need to bring these ideas to market. You know, out of the 100,000 graduates who do their national service after the bachelor's degrees in Ghana every year, only 10,000 of them will get jobs within the first year of graduation. So 90,000 of them will stay frustrated and sad and depressed for many years. And now you have researchers telling us that Africa will be home to about over a billion young people by 2050. And then you know that this is dangerous. Where will they work? How will they stay healthy? How will they eat? I think we have a massive humanitarian crisis looming large on us. Granted, the government of Ghana some universities, organizations, and others are doing what they can within the limit of their resources to solve this problem. That being the case, I think there's a lot more needs to be done. A lot more help is needed. Financial inclusion can help, but only when there is efficient and easy access to venture capital and to microfinance and to support. When there is efficient and easy access to financial services for women, for the rural poor, for the underprivileged, and the underserved. Luckily, some people have decided to rise to the challenge. Scott Glasgow and Finn Mango have decided to rise to the challenge. Benji Fernandez and Nala Mani have decided to rise to the challenge. MasterCard Foundation and Celluland have decided to rise to the challenge. And I, through the Saba Foundation, have decided to rise to the challenge. After this crisis is over, uh, it is my hope to do a fundraiser, to, uh, to be able to raise funds to begin our programs, not only in Ghana, but, the African, on, but on the African continent, to help support students and entrepreneurs who have been on the fringes of society and attended to and uncared for. So now let me come to you. Wherever you are, please know that our very core, we're bound together by our shared humanity. COVID-19 has shown us that we have similar fears and aspirations and worries. That what happens in a remote village in Ghana should concern us that the worries of patients who are fearing death in Wuhan, China, are our worries as well all over the world. That the problems of unemployed youth and struggling entrepreneurs in Ghana and in Nigeria and in Kenya and in South Africa are our problems as well. So my brothers and sisters, my friends, wherever you're at, whether you're black or white, yellow or colored, man or woman, young or old, please know that the God that you believe in, that the Allah that you believe in, that the Buddha that you believe in, that the universe that you believe in, that whatever you believe in, or even the nothing that you believe in has given you the power and the strength and the ability and the skills to rise to the occasion as well in your own small way. 
The time to rise to the challenge was not yesterday. The time to rise to the challenge will not be tomorrow. The time to rise to the challenge is now. Thank you very much. And I urge all of you to do whatever you can in your own small way so that so collectively all of us can make a difference and make social impact and make the world a better place. Thank you. That's so incredible. Thank you so much, Max. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today, for sharing with us. I know we're all so encouraged um, with you sharing today. Um, I know